Right, that concludes that particular section, and now it's over to you as the audience. It's an opportunity for you to ask questions or make comments. And I'll try and, uh, we've got about 20 minutes to do this until 10 to 9, I think. And then there'll be a uh, five minute summit, something after each of the speakers, so that we finish at 9 o'clock promptly. So, who has a question? Uh, you first, sir? Yeah. I do. Uh, thank you for the uh, methodology. Um, at the end of the last debate, you provided an alternative of the Islamic model of attaining peace, namely reaching people's hearts through love. Um, would you be willing to um, propose this New Testament um, love model uh, to your hometown, the Bronx, which is world famous for its crime rates? Well, uh, in defense of the Bronx, it's not as bad as uh, anyone, <laughs> <laughs> as people here. Uh, I live in the Bronx, it's, uh, it's not all that bad a place. No, I wouldn't let my wife walk down some streets at, uh, at night alone. Uh, but as far as uh, the alternative, reaching uh, people with love, uh, again, the, the Christian view is that there are governments and that the, the governments do in, enforce laws. And generally, almost every government that's ever existed has had certain basic laws uh, in common. Uh, so, as far as reaching people with love, that's not, that's not really what I meant. Uh, I meant that how do you actually really change a society? You don't go in, conquer it, force everyone to submit to a certain view, because then people don't really agree with it. They don't even really believe what, what, they're, what they're doing. Whereas, whereas in Christianity, the goal is to change the society, and then society, if there's going to be governments or whatever, society would then, who, are, who are now influenced uh, by good and just laws would then influence uh, the government. So, no, I'm not saying, not saying hey, if someone's, if someone's going, to, if going around killing, I'm going to go and talk to them and say, uh, hey, you know, I love you, as if this is going to uh, solve the problem. No, we need everything. No, we, need the, we need the governments instituted by God. Uh, we, need, we need love as well. Um, but yes, if you go around forcing people to, to uh, submit when they don't really believe in something, uh, I, I don't think that's, that's going to be so lasting. So this one's not holistic? Uh, no. Okay, gentlemen the back, yes. All right, yeah, just uh, for a thing here. Um, just, uh, I, I seem to get too paradigm so the kingdom is not this world concept. Uh, I, I seem to think that there is uh, uh, an idea that uh, Christ will come again and move on this earth. And then there's uh, separation from the actual people who actually become the body of the church as another kingdom in itself. So I'm trying to um, understand: is that is that a distinction between those kingdoms, or or what? Yes, there there good question. This, there is going to be a future kingdom of God. This is post-resurrection. Uh, this will not be the exact same world we're in now. There will be no more corruption. I mean, even corruption of the of the physical realm. God is going to restore all things, and that will be. Uh, a kingdom, that would be a kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is right now. When Jesus left heaven to come to earth, where was he going? He wasn't going to Bethlehem, that's just a stopping place along the way. He wasn't even going to the cross, that was another stopping place along the way. According to the New Testament, Jesus will indwell believers in him. And so where was Jesus going? Jesus was going here. The kingdom of God is wherever Christians gather uh, in his name. The kingdom of God is right here. It's in China. It's in Japan. It's in South America. It's in the Middle East. That's the kingdom of God. So uh, as far as in the world now, there is a spiritual kingdom of God. And uh, this is a kingdom that, that we don't start fighting for. Not, not in physical form. So any questions for Abdullah specifically? <laughs> uh, thank you, Abdullah, for clarifying some of the ways you understand um, Christian, Christian thinkers and how love can be integrated within sort of use of force in certain circumstances. I think I use force rather than violence because that has other sort of connotations. But I'd like to challenge your trichotomy where you say Christians divorced from politics, e.g. Mennonites, Quakers, Christians submitting to authority, and then Christians who use power were like the thinking leaders and so on. Because it seems to me that it's almost as if God only gets brought into the third category there. Um, I would say that people who are Mennonites and Quakers, I'm not one of them, quite a lot of them are prepared to go to prison because they believe God has said they should pay tax which goes to defence and so on. So it's not a case that they're retreating from the world, it's the case they're being highly political, they're not being apolitical. And also the issue about people who fight um, in, in wars for their country, it's not the case that they're, I think there's a lack of definition here 
possibly on both sides in terms of what it means about to fight for God. Certainly I would not support, as David's been saying, about fighting for evangelistic purposes, um, fighting to establish a kingdom, but that's different to fighting, submitting to God, believing that God thinks that in, um, from scripture that God is saying that this is a just war or whatever, and so therefore you fight for the nation, but that's not excluding God. It's not as though you're fighting for a secular cause as opposed to a divine cause. Yeah. No, no, I, I would totally agree. Uh, there is no separation. I mean, I'll just certainly hear Martin Luther said in, the, in his uh, writing, The Soldier of His Conscience. This is why God honors the sword so highly that he says that he himself instituted it in Romans 13. In Romans 13. For the hand that wields this sword and killed with it is not man's hand, but God's. And it is not man, but God who hangs tortures, beheads, kills, and fights. All these are God's works and judgments. So, uh, all, the, but, but the only thing I'm trying to say here is, Biblia tries to come off that uh, Rishem is pacifist. It's not pacifist. I'm not tagging Rishem for not being pacifist. I mean, what, I want him to come to this realization. I'm not I'm, I'm going to argue for orthodoxy. I'm not arguing for Islam, I'm arguing for Christian orthodoxy here. To come to this realization that it, Christianity is not pacifist, it gave him the rules. My only contention is, that the good intentions of Christians can be easily diverted in the wrong, wrong place because there is not a clear understanding of what constitutes a just war. Can you fight for nationalism? If Tony Blair told you, or, or Gordon Brown told you to fight, or George Bush, or now Obama, which he is in Afghanistan now, uh, is this a just, a just case? And the Christian soldier, and there are many evangelical Christians in the army, what do they do? You see? And those who are the the case is arguing that he's been arguing for pacifism, he's actually said in the last resort, he'd um, agree to fight. Can we get David to speak to us? Sorry, sorry, sorry. We're rather getting on to into debate here. Yeah. Um, so the lady there, can you make a question? Yes, I, I'd just like to say that um, Paul was a violent man until he met Jesus on the Damascus Road. And there's also many Christians abroad in violent places, just helping the ordinary people and, um, and doing things for them, which is all very peaceful. I mean, um, is it a comment or is it a comment? A comment. A comment. A comment. Okay, any more questions? Yes. yes. Uh, hey David, uh, there are millions of evangelicals who appeal to the Bible to, to find support for the state of Israel. So I want to know if you agree with them. I just want to know, does the Bible condemn or support the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian land? Uh, I have to say, generally, if I don't have a, a clear answer on something, I tend to remain agnostic and just say, I don't know. Um, is the war in Iraq just? I don't know. Should we support Israel? I believe in Israel's right to uh, right to exist and to defend itself. Uh, should I run over there and, and help them? I, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if, 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 I, if I don't know something, I'll be the first person to tell you I don't know. However, I, I, I should point out that uh, if, uh, if Abdullah is right, and that when, you, when, when a leader looks around the world and says, hey, if I see some injustice over there, somewhere else in the world, or I see oppression somewhere, I should run in and fight, I'd say if you hold that view, then you should run into Iraq and, and fight in Iraq, and you should run and fight the Palestinians, because it becomes, hey, I see oppression, therefore I should go. So given, if I held to uh, his view to a greater extent, I would certainly say yes, uh, but uh, I don't, and I'm, I'm not sure about that. Right. Well, you know, I'm just going to respond to that as well. Then Yaya is going to say something. The guy in the glasses. Then Nabil. I'll never see him. He's an internet after that. And then you. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Um, right. In this debate, it's meant you know two people come together and they meant to, obviously they meant to persuade someone else to, to guide the other person or guide them with the audience whilst they sit and listen. But for the per for person who has who obviously claims the truth, has this Bible and so on to guide him, he doesn't know a lot of things about the good and bad in this world that's happening and kills thousands of people who have no response to this. That's very worrying. You don't have a response to this? Thousands of people dying and you don't have to answer? Is this not guiding you enough? Because if it's not guiding you enough, then you, know, you, you, you really have some serious problems. And how can you say that uh, Christianity is a force of peace when you don't even know have a response to the massacres of many people, and thousands of people in this world? Um, David, my question is for you. Um, I just want to say that from what you told us, Christianity sounded very peaceful. And I just wanted to quickly illustrate the dilemma I find myself in. From what you've said, Christianity sounds very peaceful. But if I were to give you an analogy to try and help you understand how I think about this. If a group of people were to come in the future and say that 
well, we're very peaceful, we want an ideology of peace in the world, yet the Holocaust was justified and was necessary in order for this peace to come about, would you believe they were a peaceful people? Um, uh, was, was, the, was the Holocaust necessary? If they gave that analogy, I'm just saying. If they gave that particular example. Someone said they justified the genocide, essentially. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm coming up. I've got a question for David. But before that, I've got a, comment, uh, a general comment to make. Because listening to uh, Abdullah, um, I became a Christian 18 years ago. And I'm not really the teachings of uh, apostles and our parents. So I don't know, maybe I need to say, <laughs> if there's something deficient, I maybe mean, I've done something wrong. But yes, that be it. See, I've got tremendous respect and, and appreciation for those who fought. And I always thought it was a just war. Can you, they what, what's your opinion on a just war, if any? And how do you contrast it with Abdullah's as an Islamic concept of a just war? Because we might be thinking just war in a certain sense, and you might be thinking of a just war in a different sense. How do you contrast that, the general opinion of a just war with the Muslim opinion of a just war? Uh, yes, if, if I had been around in, uh, in the time of Hitler, if I had been uh, German, I am, I am German, uh, but if I had an opportunity, I hope, I hope I would have fought him uh, if I had this opportunity. So yes, when there is uh, extreme justice, injustice in the world, uh, I do not disagree with Abdullah on this, that people must stand against it. Now, there are various ways to stand against it. Um, uh, there's a book called The White Rose about a group of young Christian students uh, who published pamphlets against what Hitler was doing and spread them, and they were all ultimately killed for uh, spreading information uh, about Hitler, calling for resistance against Hitler. So uh, as far as what a just war is, my, my view would not be much different from uh, Abdullah's as far as uh, governments uh, can and should fight uh, oppression. When oppression reaches a certain level, um, it might even be necessary for someone else to step in. Um, what, what I don't agree with is that this is done in the name of, of any particular religion to establish any particular ideology. It would be uh, for love of a, group, of a group of people. It's, uh, yes, it, it is done in love. Uh, we love those people here. Those people are going to be wiped out or slaughtered or, or horribly tortured, and we, uh, we need to protect certain people. So yes, it would, it would, anything that is a just war would have to be done out of love, but at the same time, it wouldn't be done out of hatred for the, uh, for the oppressive group who love them as well, even though they might need to, uh, might need to stop. Now the other next. I have a question for Abula. Um David mentioned during, during the course of the debate that Christianity uh, is the religion off which uh, basic principles of government have been built. The concept of a state and the definition of a state is not found within the New Testament. Rather, the principles that transform someone individually are used by those people in conversation to determine how their government should be built. So it, it seems that uh, I, I didn't hear a good response to you, uh, from you about that. And in order to elicit that response, I'd ask you this very simple question. Is there any place in the New Testament where violence is enjoined upon people in general? Okay, okay. people in general, what do you mean people in general? Like as, as, a, as, as a tenant for people, well, is there any place in the New Testament where violence is enjoyed? Well, yeah, I said in 2 Peter 2.13, and uh, where, where it says that the, the ruler is going, is going to uh, uh, punish people, uh, the unrighteous and so on. And again, Romans 13, which I keep uh, citing again and again and again, I said that constantly that the wrath of the, so the Lord does not bear the sword in vain, but he is the wrath of God. You know, to punish the iniquitous. And of course, um, you know, there are, there are many kind of, as I said, where it says in uh, the New Testament that uh, everything can be used in the Old Testament as goods and wise for teaching. And the New Te Old Testament has loads of uh, places where it gives you punishments. And of course, uh, Paul said in, uh, I think it was Romans or I put somewhere here, he said essentially that. The, the law is only for the unrighteous. If you're righteous, you're not going to break the law, so it's not going to be for you. But it's for the unrighteous who break the law. So there must be a law in place. And if you're talking about the law, it must be the Old Testament law. You could argue that very strongly. 
And that should be in place only for the other righteous who break that law. So there is the violence which is mandated by the Muslim. I'm not saying it makes Christianity bad and evil. I'm just saying that it does mandate violence. But not as on an individual level, but on a state level. Or as, a, as part of institutions and soldiers and so on and so forth. Okay? Yes. David, I would like to ask you, let's comment and then I'll put the question again. You believe Jesus was crucified. Why God didn't have mercy in his own son and he went on to be crucified himself and to be saved to save his own son? Mm -hmm. sure it's no, no, but it's 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 violent. Oh, we, we, we are having a concept of no, God no, no, on Sunday, okay. Sunday, or this is Saturday, yeah. 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 In Luke 19, 27, for these enemies of mine who did not want to me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them before me. That is Jesus. Now, watch what happened right here. In my yeah. opening statement, I said you always have to look at the context. Uh, Muslims constantly appeal to this verse. Jesus says, this is saying, as Jesus, Jesus said, as for those enemies who didn't want me to rule over them, bring them here and slay them before me. You see there, Jesus is calling for people to slay. Now, start earlier in the same passage, Jesus, where it says Jesus told them a parable about a king who came to an area and the people didn't want him to rule over them. So, uh, so he left, and they started up a rebellion against him. And then, when he returned, when he returned, he said, "Now for those, now for all those people who rebelled against me, bring them here." So this is a parable. It's about a king. It's about a king. Now, is this telling us something about Jesus? Yes. This passage is about Jesus. He's saying, "I'm going away now. All kinds of people are going to rebel against me, and when I come back, I'm going to judge them." So, does this have anything with Jesus now telling us to uh, to kill people in His name? Of course not. But when it's quoted on Muslim websites and Muslim books and so on, that's exactly how it appears. Jesus said, "Kill them." Okay. So. Uh, um, sorry, I'm just a little confused. You're saying that um, Christianity spread the fastest in the first three centuries because Muslims were under oppression and uh, they, was, they, they took that and that's why it spread. But then you say that when, if you were under the Hitler regime and you saw that oppression, you would fight against it. I don't understand which way around you're working. Are you fighting against something or would you suffer the oppression? Because that would harm your cause for spreading Christianity if you were to stand up against Hitler. Um, no, there, well, no, good question, but there's, there's, there's a difference here. During the first three centuries of Christianity, um, when Christians were not fighting, this wasn't, you know, as far as number-wise, this wasn't the greatest period, but as far as uh, how Christianity, um, you know, percentage-wise, for instance, millions of people becoming Christians every year in China, for instance, now. Um, but no, when these people were commanded to live peacefully, turn the other cheek, not return violence for violence, they were obedient to God, and it seems to me that God, that God blessed them later on. They said, no, we want to be like everyone else and fight like the Roman Empire and so on. And things have been disastrous for, for a long time afterwards. And it took the West uh, centuries and centuries to start breaking away from that way of doing things. Uh, when, we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about someone like Hitler, this is not, hey, he's persecuting us and therefore we need to fight him. This is, he is oppressing... Uh, he's oppressing this group right here and trying to annihilate everyone in that group. Uh, should we stand up against something like that? I would say uh, the answer is yes. And just to give you, a, you know, uh, uh, more uh, more of an idea, if someone were to come to me, if uh, if if, uh, if an angry person after this debate were to come up to me and attack me, uh, do it. You, you can beat me into the ground. I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm not going to defend myself. If I saw someone. Uh, attacking this man or attacking this man, I'd, uh, I'd probably stop it. I'd do everything I can to stop it. Okay. Stop it. I have to look like a few points. Actually, I'm just, just to um, correct you, the Christianity um, was spread fastest through the first few centuries. When it attains state power, Constantine, then it spread really fast. A lot of it was forced persecutions, unfortunately, and they believed they were doing the love of God by helping the heathens to come to salvation. Uh, and they believed that coercion was necessary. And I, I, if, they, if I had time, I would have quoted the, uh, all four of the, the church fathers about how coercion, especially Thomas Aquinas, um, coercion can be used.
to uh, bring people to salvation. Uh, but again, it was after the attained state of power. Okay, the very last question. We're running out of time. This gentleman has to go on. Good question for David. According to Luke 22, verse 26, um, this is just before Jesus has been increased as well, just only and praise to be saved from the death on the cross. Jesus commands to two of his disciples, his disciples to sell their belongings to purchase two swords. And one of those swords is then used against the land of the country to take Jesus to the cross. How do you reconcile that with your love, your enemy, and uh, peaceful, general peaceful message? Well, this is, this is another good question. Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus tells his followers, uh, go buy some swords. And his disciples say, we have two. And he says, that's enough. But now, is Jesus planning an armed rebellion? Is he planning to go out and spread Christianity uh, with violence? Of course not. Two swords would not be enough for that. That's clearly not the meaning of what he said. And by the way, just a little later, when one of his followers decides to use one of these swords, he says, stop it. What the, what, what are you doing? Uh, so what does Jesus mean here? Well, I, I have to think that it's found right there in the passage when Jesus says that, uh, that he says, go buy swords. Why? And he says, for it is written. He says it is written that he will be numbered among the transgressors for the Romans to come. I mean, for the for the uh, for the authorities to come and lock him up. They need a justification, and that justification is that he is part of a group of rebels. And so it seems that this is a fulfillment of a prophecy here. I want you guys to have swords because it's written that I am to be numbered among a group of rebels. This is not hey, we're going to go and fight with them. It's when people show up, uh, they need their justification to go and uh, to go and kill them on the cross. So it's you know, my thoughts. The like, well, announcement here it doesn't tell you what you are telling me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, sir, we're going to have to uh, wrap it up there. Sorry, no, Thank no. you very much for your comments and your questions. Uh, I'd like to invite the speakers now to give their final five minute summary. And uh, we'll do it in the order that we started, and I'd like David to begin. All right, well, we've, uh, we've covered a lot of issues. I'll try and zoom through some of them for uh, some final comments. Uh, Villa says Christians desire peace, and he says that a Christian government would be according, uh, governed according to Old Testament uh, laws. No, a Christian government, if there, were, if there were going to be a Christian government, we have all sorts of principles, uh, to, uh, biblical principles on how, uh, how we would go about this. It would be uh, God loves everyone. And so every person is in the world is important. Uh, now, I'm a philosopher. I study, and by the way, I teach philosophical ethics, so I study, teach the ethical systems of various ages. Uh, go to someone like uh, Aristotle, the greatest ancient Greek uh, uh, ethics, a man of ethics. Uh, Aristotle, or Plato, or even Socrates. You, never, you know what you never see? You never say, uh, hey, you should love everyone in the world. Uh, you should seek the good of everyone in the world. Uh, all people are created equal. If you were to tell Aristotle, any of the ancient Greek thinkers, all people are created equal, everyone's equal, they would say, what in the name of common sense are you talking about? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. That would have been their response. They <coughs> rail against these sorts of things. And you, it's not until you get to Christianity where you find, uh, well, you have this in the Old Testament where God says that he loves the alien. Uh, the aliens must not be harmed among the Jews because God has love for them. But then we have the full revelation when we get to Jesus Christ that God has a concern for everyone, that God wants us to live in peace with everyone. Um, and so, and, and by the way, Paul even says, he's talking to a slave and a slave owner, and he says, there is no partiality between you. God is like one of you is better than the other. Uh, so has Christianity influenced uh, governments? Has Christianity influenced the world for the better? Given the, the older ways of thinking, you have never had any of this. You have never had the idea that I should be worried about what's going on in Afghanistan. Or I should be worried about what happens in China. You would have never had this. Who cares? They're over there. But in Christianity, we have a concern for everyone. And this has spread all over the world. This has spread all over the world. So that's certainly a positive impact. He says, uh, Christians didn't fight in the beginning because we, are not, we were in a minority. No. The numbers of Christians spread uh, very rapidly. They could have fought in certain areas. Again, they were in various areas of the world. They could, have, they, could have started, uh, they could have started fighting. They didn't fight because they were commanded not to fight. They believed in the New Testament and they were told not to fight. Um, he said Christians didn't fight in the army because it required paganism. Uh, no, they just didn't want to fight. By the way, there were certain Christians in the army they were told to, uh, to, to stay in the army. But they weren't out there fighting. Uh, this was a, this was, there was the separation. They were fighting uh, for the Roman government, but not for Christianity. It says, feeding the enemies was commanded in the Old Testament. Good. We believe in the same God of the Old Testament. 
Uh, and he says it only means if you're in power. If you're in power over your enemy. No, Paul was never in power over any enemy. And he still said that we should feed our enemies. We are to show concern for them. He asked, why did I say that Islam is a religion of peace simply because it allows violence? Well, now I'm saying that Christianity allows violence, and yet I say it's still peaceful. Why the inconsistency? Well, there is no inconsistency. I never criticize Islam for allowing some violence. I, am, I think it's abundantly clear that I am not a pacifist. Uh, I criticize Islam for saying, kill the unbelievers, fight the unbelievers. Those who do not believe in Allah. That's why I criticize in Islam, and that is something that Christianity specifically condemns. He says most Christians go to their pastors for information. We have to turn to people of scholarship and learning, so why not turn to people like Aquinas and Augustine? I do believe you should turn to people like Aquinas and Augustine, uh, as long as what they're saying is consistent with the New Testament. Uh, so I don't have any problem with going to scholarship. Um, he says, I haven't shown that Aquinas or Augustine were in... Correct. Well, I don't see many places where I'm in where I'm in disagreement with them. Again, I've been constantly uh, represented tonight as a, as a pacifist, which just isn't my position. I'm saying that Christianity is not a state; it is not an earthly kingdom, and we are not to fight in its name. Uh, Christians who come to power believe in going biblical. The Testament I've already uh, addressed that. Um, uh, he, he says that he, he said earlier that Aquinas appealed to natural law because the New Testament just doesn't give us laws. Absolute nonsense. Aquinas appealed to natural law because he was wondering why are there people all over the world who follow some of the same rules that we do. So there must be some sort of natural law that God made us so that we have some light as to how we are to live. So that any person in the world could recognize that he is a sinner, that he sinned against God, that he is in need of salvation. Um, he said that Christianity is not a force uh, of peace in the world. I mean, go to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Where did you get that idea? Go back to the New Testament. God loves everyone. God has created everyone. There is no partiality. It says this in the New Testament. Um, it says, I don't have enough uh, guidance from the Bible to know what I'm supposed to do in the world. So, David, you don't, you don't know what you're supposed to do with the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict or within Iraq. It's not that I don't know enough about the Bible. It's that I don't know enough about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or uh, what's going on in Iraq. Uh, sorry. Okay. I didn't mean to tack up your phone. Uh, Abdullah, you have uh, five minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, well, the early church fathers, okay, I'm, I'm going to mention a whole bunch of points and surmise. The early church fathers did talk about our uh, being issued um, of why um, the, it restricted the Christians in, in uh, joining the Roman army. Read Tertullian's book on, on idolatry, and that would answer your point. Um, Lastly, well, he tried to throw a red herring on oh, the Quran says, by the unbelievers. Oh, it's very interesting to quote that. I could just say, well, okay, Jesus says, uh, I think I'm not, I'm not going to bring peace with the sword, and leave it like that. And just to quote it out there. It means really, it sounds really bad. But again, uh, I advise you to perhaps look on our website, check the, 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 the video that we're going to put up on our last talk, where he brought up again, and we clarified for him what that meant, and not just to drop red herrings. Secondly, um, my, my, my issue is, Governments can either be two things. It can either be secular law or Old, Old Testament law. Old Testament law generally will cause uh, oppression if you separate it from the, the uh, inherent uh, halakha laws of the Jews. If you say, no, we don't follow it anymore, just have a basic, do not commit adultery, stone the adulterer. If someone, Jesus said to the, uh, some of the Pharisees that why don't you, you know, uh, it, why do you not kill your, your son who is basically um, dishonoring his father and mother in the Bible. So these things can cause oppression. And that's why, that's one extreme. The other extreme is, is uh, Christian, Christian governments, well not really Christian, but they become secular, who do secularism and then their goals and objects become materialistic. And then they will go around the world fighting for materialism, exploitation, and so on and so forth, which causes injustice again. So in either of those two paradigms, we have injustice and oppression. And that was my point that, um, with all due respect, I, I absolutely, I, I think all Christians have uh, well, you know, well, most Christians, most practicing, and definitely the most practicing Christians have very good intentions as well. Very good intentions. I have not seen otherwise from, from practicing Christians. But uh, the intention is not enough. There's no method to bring about oppression. I can simply uh, uh, this, this abuse him of, of his belief that um, you know, uh, uh, Christianity cannot answer these issues by asking him what is oppression and give me a biblical understanding of it. What is, what is human nature? Give me a biblical understanding of it. How do you judge oppression? Where is, how is this judgment of oppression by a state? Uh, is, it, uh, is it capitalism? Is it capitalism oppressive system? Is it communism or Nazism? One can say communism is a law of love. Love the poor. Isn't it? Love the poor. And the meek shall inherit the earth. Well, that's very communist. 
very common thing. Um, not, you could even argue, even really crazily, that Nazism is love of Germans, love of the German nation and background. You see, every, all injustice happens from love, but it's what you love. And how you regulate that love. Maybe you can love someone so much, you, you, you love your wife too much, that you, uh, you, you deny yourself your own rights, or, or, or vice versa. You know, a, a woman could be too obedient to her husband that she denies herself her rights. That's love gone astray, too much, gone OTT. Just say, the law of love, it sounds great during the 70s, but it has no methodology. Um, I think, I, I want to say that may, I think maybe we should see about what Jesus said. Yes. Well, uh, what Jesus said is that I, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, to, or in Greek to render it perfect, or to uh, render it to be uh, perfected or complete. Jesus did not want to abolish the law, and I think that is because of this going astray from the law, that Christians don't know what to do now. What do we do? Is it, well, I don't know, uh, uh, what, how do we organize this, or do we just use some morals in the Old Testament and, in, in, and uh, use what God's punishment in the most severe sense that the Old Testament does? Or is it more nuanced than that? Again, maybe to speak to your local friendly neighborhood Jew, to give you some advice, but I think that uh, it's just having a law of love is very great, but as this famous saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So good intentions is not enough. So just saying that we desire peace is not enough. I think I've said most things though, but I can say a couple of things. Now, to be very quick, David uh, uh, sometimes distorts or uh, misaligns my religion. He says that we don't become experts with, with, uh, with non-believers. I could say 2 Corinthians 6.14 does the same, but I'm not going to because I'm not going to use his methodology. He says that we're allowed to lie. Um, I could say that 1 Corinthians 9 where, where um, uh, Paul said there are more things to all men, where St. John Chrysostom, the golden mouth, funny enough, says uh, that great is the force of the sea, provided it is not excited, excited by treacherous intention. So you can lie as long as you don't have a bad intention. I can use the same thing, but I'm not going to because it's bad scholarship. It's just nitpicking and trying to find things against other persons, mudslinging. It's not the real truth. And I, like, I wish you had the same approach to me as I did for Christianity. I argue for orthodoxy. So my last message is, I believe that all you, you good Christians here, and obviously you Muslims here, we all desire peace. And peace is great. And may our hearts you know, unite together and so on. But we need a methodology. And that's why I say Islam brings peace. And Christianity, unfortunately, needs to find a way, a method, by which it can bring peace other than waiting for Jesus to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone for persevering through this long evening with us. It's been a fascinating discussion. I hope we've all gained some in terms of knowledge and understanding.